And this, as the government brings in that rule of six law, attempts to pass that contentious bill to override the Brexit withdrawal agreement. Donald Trump claiming he's entitled to a third term. Liberals claim these are all attacks on their values. But in this day and age... Isn't everyone a liberal? I thought so. In his latest book, Ian Dunt tells me tells the story of liberalism from birth in the fight against absolute monarchy to modern day resistance against populism. So what exactly is a liberal? Um, Ian Dunt is, of course, a political journalist and author of How to Be a Liberal. Um, Ian, if anyone was ever going to write a book called How to Be a Liberal, it was absolutely going to be you. Afternoon. <laughs> I'm flattered by that. Yeah, no, there's an absolute compliment in that. Well, firstly, um, congratulations. I didn't even know. Every now, I keep up with your endeavours, of course, on social media. I, I didn't know you were capable in, capable of staying in long enough to be able to knock out a mighty shelf breaker <laughs> like this. It was more fun than the last book, which was about Brexit. So I had to spend the whole yeah. months on end learning about fishing quotas and very, very boring things like this. So at least in this case, when I wasn't in the pub. I was getting to find out about the French Revolution and John Stuart Mill and things like that. Nice. I mean, I'm going to remind you of this this conversation again. I know I have before, but j- just to take it back to Brexit, it was, I don't know how many years ago, you and I were talking in a different radio studio b- b- before 2016, probably as Cameron was, you know, just gearing up to announce there was going to be a referendum. And I remember you saying... Um, I really hope there isn't. And I said, is that because you, you know, you're a Remainer or a Brexiter? I don't even think those phrases had even found their way into the the, mm. the, the kind of public lexicon. You said, no, no, it's not that at all. Forget that. It's the fact that we will talk about nothing else for the next half a decade. <laughs> and I, I, as recently as last week, I, I, I repeated that line from you. And I thought, you know, OK, probably not half a decade. But as it turns out, um, you are indeed the enlightened one. This is very, very rare that I get called those terms. So I'm very, I'm very happy to accept it. I'll take any instance in which I was right with, um, yeah. with great grace. You know, I mean, the thing is, we're not even, I mean, I think we're still at the beginning. And looking at it this week, you really get a sense of just how long this is going to go on. Because imagine where we're going to be in a year's time. Yep. There's going to be some other trade problem. And when that happens, this government's going to respond to it by trying to go for this sort of apocalyptic culture war break, saying we're going to tear up international law or we're going to appeal to our base. And in all of those cases, we're basically going to get sucked back to ultimately talking about Brexit. It is so, so tiresome, so incredibly boring. And I, at the moment, have the suspicion that we're going to be talking about it for the rest of our lives. Yeah. I mean, well, let's just pick up on that point, because when we talk about, you know, liberals and populism and, and, and all of those kind of sort, sort of, I don't want to call them battles. And, and sometimes we do. Perhaps in our industry, we, we perhaps frame things through the via the prism of social media a bit. And then you come to the real world and you think, actually, I'll go and see my sister for a bite to eat. And she's not talking about any of this stuff at all. <laughs> so there is a little bit of, of, of that, of the village mentality, maybe. But certainly on, on Brexit, I mean, that seems to have di- clearly divided the room. That's obvious. But in terms of what else it's done... Uh, this populism thing that you talk a lot about. I mean, not everyone who voted Brexit, I'm thinking of obvious people uh, on the left, for example. You know, Tony Benn would have been a Brexiteer. The mm-hmm. smart money suggests Jeremy Corbyn probably dobbed the ink in that particular box as well back then in, in 2016. And Dennis Skinner, we know, uh, was a Brexiteer. But beyond that, there is this idea that, that you know anyone that voted to leave the EU is some kind of mad populist knucklehead. Yeah, I mean, I got I made quite a lot of friends after the referendum from the liberal leave side to people that supported Brexit, but didn't go in for the kind of more nationalist rhetoric that we were hearing. So the anti-immigrant stuff, the attack on truth, the constant references to the people, there was plenty of leavers who just didn't go in for that stuff, just said, look, don't really like the look of the project, looks political, looks like the kind of thing that centralizes power. I want out, but I still generally want the single market stuff. We want to be able to trade as freely as we want. We still want freedom of movement. So there are a lot of people like that. And the estimates that you see when you look at the polling from from before the referendum was it was between 40 to 20 percent of leave voters would, for instance, either say on those particular statistics would either say that they supported immigrate, they supported freedom of movement or that they weren't prepared to see any change in freedom of movement if it would have economic damage to the country. So both of those you can take as kind of a single market soft Brexit position. There was quite a few. The thing is, those guys got drowned out badly after the referendum result. And I think you can make pretty clear during the referendum as well. And what did we get instead? We got this relentless drumbeat 
against freedom of movement, against immigration. We got this constant reference to that phrase, the people. And we're still hearing it now. I mean, Boris Johnson brought it up in the last PMQs when he was getting himself up into a bit of a blather about the fact that Keir Starmer hadn't asked him about Brexit. Talk about the will of the people again. Now, this is the thing. Under liberal theory, there is no such thing as the people. What there is under liberal theory is individuals. And individuals have their own eccentricities. They have their own values, their own interests. They do not form one homogenous blob. And every time you have a conversation with someone in the real world, you find that that's instantly the case. Right? That's, that Thatcher, that's Thatcherism, right? Well, Thatcherism is a form of right-wing economic liberalism. It's a kind of liberalism. It's right-wing economic liberalism. You can also go to the left. So, for instance, if you think about the individual, you can think, what does the state have to do to make sure that this person has a job, to make sure that this person can put bread on the table, to make sure that we interfere with companies so that they actually provide for their workers and provide for consumers? So you can go to the left or the right on it, but ultimately your moral focus is the individual. And when people talk about the people, when they talk about the public like a big homogenous blob, that is not liberalism, and it is, in fact, very, very dangerous. You look throughout history, every time it happens, very, very bad. But how, do, how else do you define, I mean, th is the word the people not used in this context really just to highlight and indicate the result of a referendum? No, it's used to pretend that everyone has exactly the same opinion. So, I mean, if you, if you get a referendum result, as we did, and as you could say the same thing for the American elections or, you know, for elections in Hungary or Italy or, or Brazil or any other of the other countries that are facing this exact same problem. You basically have a collection of different votes. I mean, in this one, we had 52 to 48 percent. Now, that's pretty tight. That does not warrant deciding you're going to go off in one direction very, very hard. It demands that you come up with a compromise. But you won't come up with a compromise if your definition of the population is just the people. If only the 52 percent count and the others get jettisoned. So on that basis, no, it's not really a byword for that. What it is, it's an attempt by the state, and it does this all the time. You go back to Cromwell in the English Civil War, this is what happened. You go back to Robespierre in the French Revolution, this is exactly what happened. Someone comes along, they say, I channel the will of the people. It's exactly what Theresa May said. It's exactly what Boris Johnson said. But they're not really representing their interests. What they're doing is saying, whatever it is that I have decided, I now get to sort of hoover up that democratic legitimacy and pretend that I'm this representative. The only people they really represent are themselves. And so today, as we look at it right now, we will hear again in today's debate in Parliament over the breaking of international law, the will of the people, the will of the people. You look at the polling, that is not what it is. The majority of people in this country do not support breaking international law, whether they're a lever or a remainer. So in terms of Boris Johnson in particular, I mean, he's the most curious character to me at all. I, I think I've said this to you before. If you go back 10 years when he was mayor of London, if you'd have said 10 years ago, think of a right wing conservative, you'd have gone through a lot of names before you got to Johnson. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Because he doesn't have a single conviction. I mean, he doesn't have any principle that he has shown throughout his public life, apart from the fact that he wishes to be prime minister. Now, that is not the case to, to her credit, to be fair, for Theresa May. I mean, Theresa May did have principles that she cared about. The main principle is she wanted to reduce immigration. She basically hated immigration. Now, I passionately disagreed with her on that, but at least I could respect the fact that she had that principle. Boris Johnson doesn't have it at all. Instead, what's happened with him is that he will hitch his sails to wherever the political wind is blowing in order for it to advance his career. Now, if the world had been different, if the situation had been different, he would have been a very prominent Remain Tory MP, very pro-immigration, very multicultural, all of that. And that indeed was the way the wind was blowing when he was London mayor. Yeah, so definitely. that's what he was. Talked about amnesties, now, for goodness sake. Exactly, yeah. Now the wind is blowing in a different direction, so he's a completely different human being. So in that capacity, there's almost no one who's more cynical than him. And I mean that when you look across the world. Like, look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, right? He is more pernicious, more dangerous, more extreme than Boris Johnson by 100 times. But at least you can say of him that he genuinely has those convictions. Even Donald Trump, who's this kind of, you know, if he was smart enough, he'd probably be a fascist, but he just doesn't have the intelligence enough to, to express any kind of real ideology with coherence. But at least he's consistent. He's always hated the competition that Asia presents to America. He's always hated Mexicans. He's always hated immigration. So there is a degree of consistency to him. That is not the case with Boris Johnson. He will go whichever way the wind blows. So is Johnson ultimately the catalyst for your book? Was he the colonel or was it Brexit and all that went with it, which would, of course, encompass Boris Johnson? No, it's the worldwide pattern. 
I mean, look, you, you look at the US, it is exactly the same language, the same process. Look at the way the government treats journalists in the US. The same thing as we see here, the blacklisting of media outlets, the attacks on the independence of journalists, for instance, at Channel 4 News, various other outlets, including ITV and BBC programmes, um, the relentless use of the word the people, the use more perniciously of the phrase enemy of the people, suggesting that those who disagree with you politically are actually against the interests of the nation itself. The relentless anti-immigration messaging that we get is the same in the US, it's the same in Brazil, it's the same in Hungary, it's the same under Salvini in Italy. This is a worldwide situation that we are looking for. But isn't, and each... but, I was just going to add to that, sorry to interject him, but, but no, you no, know, the, 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 the right accused the left of precisely the same tactics. Oh, the left does have many of the same problems. Like you look at parts of what is going on in the identity politics part of the left and you see exactly the same. So what we get for the people when we're talking about and basically, you know, it's usually a reference to sort of indigenous populations in Western countries. When they talk about the people, they're talking about people in towns, usually left behind communities, predominantly white, predominantly working class. Now, you get exactly the same process going on on the left when people talk about race, when they talk about gender, when they talk about sexuality, where they talk about those like homogenous blobs in which people don't have any individuality within them. So there's a sort of reference. One of the worst phrases for this is the phrase people of color. It's very bad because it takes in such a broad range of people. Yeah. That's the majority of the human population that they've just described. And suddenly suggesting people of color feel this way about a particular political issue. And you, again, you just think, well, on what possible basis do you have to talk that way? People are not homogenous on the basis of their skin color, their race, their ethnicity or anything else. And again, when you see that happening on the left, that is the decline of liberalism. And when you see it happen, it is a profoundly dangerous moment because you're just wallpapering over human interest, individual freedoms, human rights, the endless eccentricities and diversity of the human species in favor of your big walloping political simplicity. So yeah, you see it on the left just as much as the right. The difference is the left aren't in power, so it bothers me much less. Okay, we'll come back and talk some more to Ian Dunt in a few moments. The book, it's out now. It's an absolute belter. It's called How to Be a Liberal. Absolute belter isn't written on the back, though, as one of those kind of like media recommendations. I'll talk to Ian about that in a few moments. I was just... Uh, just before we went to the break in, I was looking at the names on the back of the book who've all given their kind of, you know, little thumbs up. Um, I actually know all of these people as well, which makes which makes me rather disappointed that I, I'm not on there with my It's a Belter comment. How did I miss out here? I've known you, I've known you longer than some of these people as well, which makes it even worse. Uh, sorry, well, you know, paperback edition. I'm sure we'll get It's a Belter on there, yeah. possibly in the inside front cover. I think so. On the paperback edition, maybe uh, we can re revise that. We'll talk to the publishers. I think we need to. Um, in terms of... So just define that. If you... I mean, the, the conversation about... Because I'm also fascinated by this. Liberalism, populism, identity, all that goes along with that. But, of course, the story is is not entirely new. And you, you certainly chart that journey in your book. This is... It may well have come to a a more contemporary head in recent times. But we've been here before. Yeah, we've been here many times before. And, you know, the weird thing is, like, if it, the more you look at the last 400 years, basically, so you're looking from about the 1600s to now, this process, it's almost kind of weirdly cyclical. Like, it just keeps on happening again and again and again. Certain people come out and they talk about the individual. So when they talk about it, they mean individual rights. Like, you have a sphere of protection around you as a person that no one is entitled to interfere with. And it doesn't, you know, it, this goes hand in hand with democracy. Yes, people have a vote, they elect a government, but just because that government is democratically elected doesn't mean that it gets to do things to the individual that aren't warranted. There are certain things no one can do to your sphere of freedom. And then there is another set of people. And like historically, you have people like Rousseau who would put this view across, people like Karl Marx, who basically said, look, the individual doesn't count. Like, the, the individual is just a nothingness. What really matters are these blocks of humanity. For Rousseau, he called it the general will, a bunch of people together who mm. have expressing their will. And what matters is them, usually expressed in a country or in a city state or something like that. What matters is them. They don't have any individual rights within that. Whatever they decide they want to do to any individual one of their members, they can do because all that matters is that they're expressing their will. Karl Marx had the same thing for class. Then when you get to fascism, they have the same thing for race. This is this idea that there's basically units of humanity 
that are the primary units, the only thing you ever really need to care about. And what happens to happen to the humans within it? Well, that just doesn't really matter. Right, right now, we are not in as bad a place as we were, you know, during the rise of uh, sort of Soviet communism, during the rise of fascism. But the pathway, the pathway is the same. The second that you start giving in on individual liberties, on individual rights and everything that comes with them, you suddenly start sinking towards that very, very dangerous place that we've been in many, many times before. But in terms of, you know, what Mr. Johnson is currently doing, I mean, there's the issue of immigration, which, which you've alluded to a couple of times. I mean, firstly, if you are against increased immigration or any immigration, I mean, you don't have to be a mad old racist. You might just genuinely intellectually believe that a country rubs along better in a kind of monocultural kind of fashion. And right now, when times are a bit tricky, your argument becomes even more powerful because you could say, look, it just doesn't make any sense to have extra people into a country where there's already uh, myriad problems taking place. So you, you could be anti-immigration without being a mad populist racist. Yeah, you can be. I don't know about this monoculture thing. I, I, that, I mean, look, that to me... Well, that I might be taking it a bit far, but... Yeah, yeah, that that's to me is when you fall off the other side. Of course you can have, for like, controls on immigration. And I don't think anyone says that we shouldn't have any controls on immigration. Um, I, I haven't heard anyone make that argument. You can say, as many people, including myself, want that we're going to get to a period sometime in the future where these things will become less necessary. But at the moment, I haven't heard anyone making that case. Of course, you could be for, for more restrictions on immigration. What you can't do is go into the space that originally came from a group called the New Right in France, the sort of 60s, 70s, 80s, which is essentially a group of fascists who just tried to get rid of all of the really sort of poisonous elements of fascism that meant that no one would listen to them, right? So they got rid of the totalitarianism. They said, we support democracy now. They got rid of being explicitly racist. And instead, what they came up with was this idea, which is nativism which is to say that the human being only really works when they're within a culture that is exactly the same as them, that cultures should never mix together, and that any time that cultures do mix together, it has this kind of degenerating impact on human morality, it turns people to crime. Towards them. Now, that is a poisonous, poisonous point of view. And actually, you see it expressed quite a bit. You see it expressed quite a bit in right-wing tabloids, but also, more importantly, from sort of very intellectual, very right-wing figures talking about, well, actually, you know, the, the more that we allow multiculturalism, the more that we have sharing, the more we have a problem for our own society. That just seems completely false to me. It seems to me that very, very good things come from humans sharing ideas, sharing cultures. You can go as far down as recipes or as art, or you can just go that there is increased productivity in companies which tend to have a more diverse workforce. And that is pretty much core to liberalism, that humans gain more by sharing than they do by trying to separate themselves apart. You, you could, of course, go to the other side of that, though, and take some areas of the country where social cohesion is non-existent. You've got, I think Panorama did a programme which they then revisited 10 years on, has this town, I think it was Bradford somewhere, uh, where there was a housing estate there, which was mostly Muslim, a housing estate there, mostly Indigenous. I know Indigenous is a tricky word, but you take the point. Um, sure. And nobody was fighting each other. They weren't falling out and, you know, beating each other up and robbing each other's homes. There was just literally nothing in common with the two. Now, that was a cultural thing more than anything. Um, where does that sit within a, a, a desired template that you allude to then? Well, you know what I don't get about that is pe people always, you can always find a town where stuff isn't working, and I get that. What's weird is we've spent the last four years attacking London as, you know, it's so disconnected, they're not real people. But in fact, the most diverse parts of this country, so not just London, but also the major cities, tend to have more diversity. And they tend to make that work for themselves. That's not to say it's completely perfect at all times. It obviously isn't. But in fact, most of the time, that works. Most of the time that we see things not work is when there's an introduction of immigration to a town that hasn't had very much before. And of course, there's going to be a slightly difficult period there. But what are you going to do to stop that? Just pull up the jawbridge. And even if you were to try and pull up the jawbridge in this country, we are at some point going to have to have a realistic conversation about the fact that we have an aging population. And if we were to get rid of all the people in this country who are immigrants and of working age, we're going to find it even harder to pay for the services that they that they enjoy. So I don't I mean, with those cases, you will find difficult situations, but I don't find any that tend to undo the argument in the first. Sure, place. But there are there's clearly I mean, I think David Cameron um, commissioned Louise Casey, I think, to do some work on this. And, you know, she went around the country and was looking at these sort of areas and pockets and different, more cultural problems than anything else. I mean, are, are you saying that none of that is real? It, it's kind of an, an imagined problem. There's definitely a narrative that tries to 
say to us, oh, right, if you have a set of Muslims, their culture is completely incompatible with the indigenous white culture of Britain. Now, you look at polling of Muslim communities in the UK, and they poll almost exactly the same as white working class communities when it comes to social issues. So when it comes to, I mean, things like, you know, how do you feel about same sex couples holding hands in the street? How do you feel about uh, people kissing in the street? How do you, do you feel that you should have friends who are from a different community? Now, in each and every one of those questions, there wasn't more than a 10% gap between the answers that were given in polling. Over and over, when you ask people's opinions, you find there is an distinction. But instead, what we get are a series of politicians, commentators, and a media narrative that constantly tries to pit one against the other. It's been happening specifically since September the 11th, but even arguably from earlier than that. Sure. Most of the time, you look around at diverse communities in this country, and they get on terribly well, much better than you would think by the way that we cover this information. But of course, if you've got an area where, and I know you, you may well say, well, it's, you're just picking up on one area where, a, a, you know, a, a school speaks seven different languages. Uh, you go to your local health centre and everything's written in 13 different languages. Then the sense of a, a lack of social cohesion, it, 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 that's not imagined. That's very real. I don't, I don't follow that argument at all. It just seems to me if there's seven different languages in a the school, then there's seven different languages in a school and your child will get a more diverse upbringing than he would otherwise have got. The only point I would get concerned about that is if someone said, well, you can't speak English anymore. But that never happens. And in fact, the weird thing is, this country, I always thought, did a pretty good job of these things. It wasn't like France. I mean, the French way of doing things was to basically go, no, you're French now. You know, you can't wear the hijab out. You, you know, you've got to have this sort of quite homogenous view of what it is to be French, which is secular, you know, all of that. This country was just like, well, just pretty much do, do what you like. And we're going to have trust that the notion of England, the notion of England is strong enough that it will be able to get through any amount of diversity. And in fact, will be the kind of country that people want to aspire towards, that they want to feel like they're English, that they're here for a reason, which is that they felt that in this country, they'd be given a fair shot at things, that actually this country would treat them fairly. And if they worked hard, they'd be able to do well that they wouldn't face prejudice or discrimination. Now, that relationship to me seems a really good one. We need people. People want to be part of the country and want to be part of what England is. And England offers the freedom to be who you are in terms of your religion, in terms of your culture, in terms of your personal life, while still being part of the national conversation, while still being part of a national sense of solidarity. And that, to me, is something we do well. I have no idea why we seem so intent on bombing it out because of our insecurities right now. That just simply makes no sense. But, but Boris Johnson would echo everything you just said, wouldn't he? Well, it depends on what mood he's in. As I've said, he doesn't have any firm convictions. So on a particular day, and certainly when he was London mayor, he would. I don't hear much of that from him right now. I think when you look at the treatment, especially on the asylum issue over the last few weeks, has been really, really very pernicious indeed. We don't have an asylum problem in this country. We're getting really quite modest numbers, certainly much less than they get in France, much less than they get in Italy or in Greece. And yet we've seen this really heavy handed anti-refugee response to it, which doesn't coordinate with our international responsibilities and doesn't coordinate with the better idea of what this country is. So, yeah, old school Boris Johnson 10 years ago, I'm sure he'd be on point. This new version of him prior to whichever one he turns into later, maybe not so much. Just a fi very final point, and another thing you once said to me. Let's let's finish with a, 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 another dumped Collins conversation. Um, was that, and I'm I'm sure you said this on air, and if you said it off air, I'm apologising now if I'm dropping you in in any kind of way. Uh, but you once said you'd rather go drinking with conservatives than than socialists. How is your memory so good? This is what disturbs me. It's, I mean, that must have been years ago. Duntism is something that should be taught in school, you see. So yeah, look, that's how. And that, is, and that is absolutely the case, I have to say. And it remains the case. <laughs> it, it really is. And, and in fact, anyone that's gone to like the Tory party conference or the Labour party conference, before Brexit, when things got a bit ugly, and before Corbyn, when things got ugly there, but yeah, before the tribalism hit, you're always aware the Tories made better drinking companions and they've got better wine. There you go. Love it. Um, Ian, great to have you on. We will speak again. Thank you. Ian Dunst's new book is out now. It's called How to Be a Liberal. Um, I suggest that uh, if you haven't got your 17th of September, but get ordering now. Uh, it's got all that information and more. The fact that it might divide the room, the fact that it might create a row, the fact that it might create you to want to respond to some of what Ian Dunst said is only a good